Guys, all of these brick and mortar locations are going to be closing at some time soon. Guys, they have price gouged uh, themselves out of existence, basically. Uh, think about this here also. It's also not extremely or excessively convenient uh, to go to these locations uh, because everything now is basically locked behind some type of I don't know, system, and they don't have enough employees to basically help you fast enough. So, so think about this here. You go to all these locations, you get terrible service because again, no one wants to work in the places any longer. Right. Uh, and then you're, you have to deal with prices that are absolutely crazy compared to what they once were. Right. Um, an example being guys, I'm currently building another studio. Uh, my main studio is basically being rebuilt. Uh, we just finished the, uh, the externals, all the contractors finished everything. Uh, we're just waiting for the set designers to come in and start building. Right. So for example, this uh, panel right behind me, right, he, right there, right there. It's a test panel, see what, just to see what it looks like on camera, right? Um, and the point I'm trying to make here is that the, the contractor responded back to me and said, hey, listen, um, they're going to be $200 for every 10 panels, example. Um, who wins? Who's going to win? I'm not going to pay that price for that, knowing that they're cheaper. That's crazy. So the same exact panel, same exact brand, everything is on Amazon for 33 panels, for $60, okay? Uh, this is the problem, I think, um, personally, my personal issue with a lot of these brick and mortar locations. I would rather uh, you just basically turn into a warehouse stock for uh, your company. Uh, we buy everything through, through an app, and we go there, every single parking lot has a number, we say we're here, then you deliver it. Because you really don't want us walking through your stores anyway, any longer anyway, guys. All right? That's just the reality. That's how I see it, at least, guys. My reality. Um, but all right, let's go ahead and check this out immediately. You know, why CVS and Walgreens are shutting down thousands of stores? Let's find out, King. <sighs> In June 2024, pharmacy chain Walgreens made a shocking announcement. They plan to close a significant number of stores. At this point, only 75% of stores bring in what is effectively their revenues and profits. The iconic chain is rapidly reducing its footprint, Ooh, with approximately 2,150 locations on the chopping block by 2027. This is just the latest effort by the struggling company to ride a ship that has seen a rotating door of CEOs, stagnating profits, and its share price fall more than 55% between January and July 2024. Hey guys, some people want to argue the concept, uh, these aren't price gouges. Guys, do you realize they're, they're setting record profits? <laughs> they have been setting basically record profits uh, since 2020? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, price gouging case. That's the definition of that, I would think, right? Um, you were already making all the money in the world, right? And now you're taking advantage of inflation uh, and, uh, yeah, double or tripling your prices, it seems, guys. In the Q3 report, CEO it. Tim Wentworth cited two reasons, pressure on the consumer and challenging trends in the pharmacy space. They don't have infinite time to stabilize this before it's too late. But Walgreens' problems are just the latest sign of trouble for the entire industry. CVS has been closing stores all along. Rite Aid is filing for bankruptcy. Rite Aid so exists? So what is happening to American pharmacy chains? How did Walgreens go from record highs to a bottoming stock price in just under a decade? And what does all of this mean for you? Bro, who wants to walk into a store and everything is locked up? Guys, I get it, though, as a business owner. In order to better understand the headwinds facing chain pharmacies, we have to separate the store into two parts. First, there's front of store, or retail. You know, your over-the-counter cough medicine, paper towels, makeup, candy bars, that kind of stuff. Then there's back of store, or pharmacy. We'll get to that later. First, let's start where everyone starts, walking in the front door. Walgreens of today looks very much the same as the Walgreens of yesterday. It hasn't really evolved and adapted. When it comes to retail, Walgreens is in the midst of a downward slide, seeing a 4% year-over-year decline in Q3, a continuation of a rough few years for its retail segment. The front-of-store offer, where the general merchandise is, the beauty products, isn't that good. It often doesn't look very good. The brands that they have aren't very interesting. The prices are often much higher than other destinations. And a lot of people will think, well, yes, I'm here, but why bother paying over the odds? Every couple of years I hear, here's our new plan for the front end. And it's always some new gimmick that, and then that doesn't work and then they don't talk about it anymore. As inflation squeezes customers, chain pharmacies are struggling to compete with cheaper alternatives. Oh, yeah. Like Amazon. dollar stores and big box retailers who offer larger selections and have their own in-house pharmacies. 
particularly our consumer, uh, is definitely pressed both from uh, you know the on ongoing inflation that we've seen, albeit it's somewhat moderating, as well as the amount of money that they just have uh, as we move forward. Now, Walgreens realizes that this is an issue and recently announced plans to lower costs on 1,300 front of store items. But it might be too little too late because yeah, too it's late. not just the economy that's changed, but the How way we shop. Buy things, yeah. Anybody with a pulse would know what's happening with front end, which is... Like, bro, if you guys are smart, I'm telling you, uh, the first pharmacy to just make everything app-oriented and literally turn all your brick-and-mortar locations into just a warehouse, like an inventory stock base where someone could just go, get in line, they bring it to the car, and they leave. That would be the fastest way to to fix your business. All right? you, you can use less people uh, because you're, you're looking at less, almost no shrinkage, literally no shrinkage, unless it's employees. right? Um, and then you save a lot of issues here. That's it, guys. The first pharmacy to do that wins. Yeah, they're in a pincer movement with Amazon and Walmart getting better and better. Uh, they have better price points. Um, the delivery options are getting you know, quicker and quicker. Another frequent pain point for retailers, right shrinkage here. or loss of merchandise. Oh, well, yeah, often due to damage or theft. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal, CEO Tim Wentworth cited up. high theft locations as a factor in determining which stores would be closing. Store experience has deteriorated with employee cutbacks and with shoplifting in some locations, as you know, locking the Gillette razors behind the case. The problem is anti-theft measures aren't popular as locking necessities behind glass cases doesn't just deter thieves, but it drives away paying customers. Yep. I will not buy whatever is behind there. I will go somewhere else. I'm telling you, I have I am principled. I will literally go to Amazon and just have you deliver it to my house. I will not ask for help. Locking things away behind cabinets is the biggest advertisement for Amazon that you could possibly make because it just says to the customer, this is a really hard place to shop. And yep. that's just the headwinds up front. 8 million vaccines this year at the back of the store already. That's a healthcare business, right? Uh, that's not just putting pills in bottles. When it comes to back of house operations, pharmacy and health services are Walgreens' largest source of income. In Q3 2024, pharmacy sales made up 76% of Walgreens' U.S. retail pharmacy revenue and 60% of the company's revenue as a whole. But that's been a declining business for Walgreens, largely thanks to telehealth services and lower reimbursement rates for pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs. PBM is a company that acts as an intermediary between your insurance and the pharmacy. PBM started with the idea of being a claims processor. So when you bring a prescription to the pharmacy, the pharmacy can bill the PBM. The role of PBMs has since expanded beyond just facilitating reimbursements. They also negotiate drug prices with manufacturers, determine which drugs are covered, set co-pays, set prior authorization criteria, and decide which pharmacies a patient can go to. And I think where the traditional PBM pricing model fell apart and where there's so much concern is that the, the entities here is being paid to manage drug costs, but typically benefit when drug prices increase and it creates a misaligned incentive. The issue for pharmacies is PBMs have been shrinking the reimbursement rates and pushing patients towards generic brands over name brand a move that helps the PBMs, but makes it harder for pharmacies to make money. The FDA now estimates 91% of prescriptions written in the U.S. are for generic brands. Historically, pharmacies um, made more money on generic, less money on brands, is that with the growth, particularly of the GLP-1s for diabetes, the brand volume has increased. And where pharmacies weren't making as much money on brands, as you increase that volume, it creates more and more pressure, reimbursement pressure on the pharmacies. Currently, the three largest PBMs in the U.S. are CVS Caremark, Cygnus Express Scripts, and United Health's OptumRx. These three companies alone manage almost 80% of all U.S. prescriptions. And yes, you heard that right. CVS owns its own PBM. Caremark, which is owned by CVS and CVS oh, Stores, Caremark can set whatever that. rate it wants with itself, and it's just left pocket, right pocket. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Walgreens, they're just a straight up price taker. However, the growth of PBMs has attracted federal attention, which is potentially good news for pharmacies, as the Federal Trade Commission recently announced it plans to sue the nation's three largest PBMs, accusing them of illegally driving up drug prices. So I think any time 
we can shine a light on that, put pressure on that to make sure that everyone knows what they're paying for and why they're paying for it. And so at the end of the day, people can afford the medications that they need. And that's another thing. Right. What's happening to all the people really. who need these pharmacies? What happens to communities who rely on these pharmacies once they're gone? Listen, I'm definitely an advocate for uh, if your location is consistently being pilfered from, uh, it may be time to close that location. I understand uh, your area now, that area specifically is going to become some type of desert, but um, I do not think at all a business should remain open in a, in a high crime area uh, that is that where, where their shrinkage rates are so crazy that it may be outpacing their actual profit. Um, I don't think that because, oh, the community needs it. Well, then work on the community. I'd say, right? like make it so people don't walk in there and take things all day long, right? I mean, it shouldn't be a, a culture of it because it sounds like in areas where they have to close down due to shrink, high shrinkage um, or just overall theft, these, these places shouldn't be open, guys, right? It shouldn't be, but either way. Pharmacy closure can be detrimental, especially in areas where access is already an issue. Creating something called pharmacy desert or a place with low geographic access to pharmacies. Right, all types the of definition deserts of this exist, depends on several things, like the density of the area and the resources of a neighborhood, including the median income of a neighborhood and how many, you know, the vehicle ownership of that neighborhood. According to the National Institutes of Health, approximately 15.8 million Americans live in a pharmacy desert. An NIH survey of census tracts identified over 4,600 pharmacy deserts in the U.S., with the majority being in urban areas. Theft. Again, because of theft. Right? It's not just pharmacy deserts, guys. Food deserts, education deserts. Right? All of this happens when things start looking super terrible for the area. The area is, uh, you know, falling into a blight, basically, right? There are neighborhoods in the blight. south side of Chicago that... Specifically, the south side of Chicago is going to be the reference to uh, the majority of all of these deserts, guys, right? Uh, as in, it's a pharmacy desert. It's a food desert. There are, there are really no healthy alternatives, but I w also wouldn't put a, a grocery store in the area specifically because the last one that did, I think it was Walmart, Walmart left. Right? Theft, guys. Consistent theft. All right. So, I don't know. What do we do about this? Fix the culture of the area. Uh, then maybe the locations wouldn't leave all the time, becoming deserts. But yeah, south side of Chicago is, in fact, a desert, many types of deserts. Being in urban areas. There are neighborhoods in the south side of Chicago that do not have any pharmacies. In, like, the downtown area, you might have a CVS next to a Walgreens, next to a Rite Aid. Those neighborhoods are wealthier, they're whiter, and there's more resource than the neighborhoods that don't have pharmacies. So it's not even on average, there's just inequities in the distribution of pharmacy deserts. Crime. Pharmacy closures predominantly affect low what? income <laughs> urban areas where the majority of people are on Medicare or Medicaid. Plans Tell me the crime rates of the areas. Lower reimbursement rates compared to private insurers. If that is really a right sizing, they would be closing in the neighborhoods that have the most pharmacies, not the neighborhoods the counties, including rural areas, that have fewer pharmacies on average. Both CVS and reaching. Walgreens acknowledge pharmacy deserts are an issue and claim to be taking that into account when closing stores. Walgreens, C Do not take that into account at all. At all. If your location is constantly being pilfered from, close it. EO told investors, we are the only thing standing between those places and being pharmacy deserts. And our goal is not simply to be the last one to leave. Our goal is actually to find new ways to work together. CVS CEO Karen Lynch also commented on this topic earlier this year. And we are also committed to making sure that there's not pharmacy desert, so we won't close doors where people need access to medication. If it's a footprint, the argument, like, that doesn't you. make sense. Because we know we do have evidence of like where they're closing, yeah, and right. it's not in the neighborhoods that have the most pharmacies. Of course, right. pharmacy they're closing in the areas with the most crime. Um, that's that's what they're doing, generally. Right? Like if their locations are keep, uh, you know, theft is is running rampant in their area. What do they do? They close smartly. What are you talking about? These aren't just for picking up prescriptions. Chain pharmacies offer health clinics, COVID testing, vaccines, and it's not just the customers who are impacted. The pharmacist and nearby pharmacy staff who now have to shoulder the burden of displaced customers. All at a time where pharmacists are already staging walkouts and ringing alarm bells over insufficient staffing and corporate mandates. The Bruh, problem is the average American has nothing. almost no say on if a pharmacy stays open in or closed in our area, Chicago. meaning the solution largely falls on legislation to fix. 
regulating. No, you can't legislate a company to stay open. You can't. That, what are you talking about? PBMs and potentially increasing reimbursement rates for pharmacies that are serving the most marginalized neighborhoods. So that FTC lawsuit we mentioned earlier could actually lessen the impact of closures. And there's already been movement on the state level. States obviously have a role. They can also regulate PBMs. They can also ensure that, for example, their Medicaid programs provide higher reimbursement rates for certain pharmacies. In a statement to CNBC, Walgreens stressed, we share a deep commitment to offering equitable access to health care in the communities we serve. Our priority is to ensure a smooth transition for our customers and team members during that time. Well, What's painful next? for communities, from a business standpoint, closing low-performing locations is the solution to right. a lot of the issues these companies face. I'm confused. And we know it works because someone already did it. 11.3% same-store sales increase at the, the front of the, the store for the pharmacy. I, I mean, that's that's pretty impressive. What what drives gains like that? Part of it was that they just had greater volumes at the pharmacies. And I remember CVS has been closing stores all along. They uh, expect to close up to 900 by the end of this year from where they were a couple of years ago. Other attempts to cut costs include Walgreens pulling out of its primary care endeavor, Village MD. In Walgreens Q3 investor call, CEO Tim Wentworth gave investors ideas of where Walgreens is shifting its focus next. Health, beauty, and women's health. Well, that's where the money is. It certainly hasn't taken advantage of... Like, like if you're a company and you want to make a lot of money, sell beauty products. Very strong areas of growth in the U.S., like premium beauty. It's allowed Ulta and Sephora and others to really eat up market share in that arena. And less pharmacies also means better pricing power when it comes to negotiating with PBMs. One light at the end of the tunnel is on the pharmacy reimbursement uh, care mark. I mean, they have said, look, we recognize that what's going on in U.S. or the drug retail market is not sustainable. So Walgreens could get a new contract from Caremark in 2025. Now, on the consumer level, there's been an unlikely trend emerging out of these pharmacy closures, a resurgence of independent pharmacies. It's true that independents close. They close at a much higher rate, but it's actually a question of turnover. So they're more likely to open in rural areas, they're more likely to open in neighborhoods of color and low-income neighborhoods, because that's where chains aren't. In New York City, less than 1%- of Let me hear that one more time. Because that's where chains aren't. In New York City, less than 1% of the population now lives in a pharmacy desert, a city where as of 2023, only 15% of pharmacies were chains meaning the mom and pop businesses that were run out by the chain pharmacies could be the solution when those same chains leave. Guys, guys. It definitely creates an, hold, hold a business on. opportunity for an entrepreneur to come in, start their independent pharmacy and, and service that area that needs it. All right, listen, um, give you my, my overall opinion of, of this year. You can't expect a company that is losing money consistently in an area to maintain the location in that area. There's no, there's nothing in it for them. Like businesses exist for profit almost exclusively. Um, unless it's a nonprofit, then that's a little different. Right? I mean, open up a nonprofit pharmacy if you want, then I guess, if you can even do that. I don't know. Right. But um, they mentioned uh, what, less than 1% live in a pharmacy desert in Manhattan. Guys, that one that less than one percent most likely is an area that is full of crime um it seems like the, the the woman that was talking doesn't just want to understand how that actually works businesses close because they're being robbed there's no reason to leave an underperforming location up uh or open for what why it's it's you're losing money is it's a, it's a sinkhole basically um i think we need to, to look at this uh <laughs> smartly here uh, she mentioned also that um that mom and pop locations are more likely to open up in areas that are underserved so she said here rural areas uh and areas that are underserved in general i would expect that people generally feel a lot more comfortable specifically if they're of the criminal variety they generally feel a lot more comfortable taking um pretty much openly from large corporations they do who does it affect other than everyone in the area when they leave, right? But um, that's really what the problem is, okay? So, and mom and pop locations, you know these people. You're probably not going to walk into there and take things. Let's be honest, right? Um, so that's really, that's the, 
that's the the mentality I'm guessing. I'm forecasting at least. Um, but all right, guys, listen. You guys all have an absolutely amazing day. And if you guys would like to open up a pharmacy in your area, go for it. Right? I mean, you're you're less you're much less likely uh, to have to deal with the level of shrinkage that these gigantic corporations are dealing with. That's just the reality, guys. But it seems like she did she didn't want to put that together, right? But. Either way, listen, you guys all have an absolutely amazing day. Enjoy your day thoroughly. Guys, before we go, are you guys subscribed to the other channels? Logical Movie Reviews with Mr. L. Boyd along with Mr. L. Boyd Music. Both are found in the description. Check it out.